Hello, and welcome to another exciting after show for the Partially Examined Life. Today is episode 118, uh, and I'm going to be co-hosting with Mark today. Mark, uh, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Danny? I'm doing fine here in sunny California, Los Angeles uh, specifically. I know we have some people here from California who are not from Los Angeles, but here in Los Angeles... It is a sunny day, and uh, and where where tell the people where you are. Uh, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, and it's a sunny day here. I think that's enough to generalize that it's a sunny day everywhere. Uh, but let's go around quick. All right. All right. Actually, I want to hear from folks. Uh, so so say who you are, say where you're calling from, and I, most of the people on here are in a band or something, and I drafted you specifically to be able to talk about that. So. Uh, well, let's, let's let's start with Chris. Oh yeah, so I, I'm Chris Mola, and I am speaking to you from Ojo Caliente, New Mexico. And, and yes, and, and so yes, so I was also um, in uh, Camper Van Beethoven. Okay, a founding member, but no founding longer member. you 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 said I, I won't be on a, a major label. Screw that. That would be thrown <laughs> out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yes, harkening back to the, the earlier conversation, yeah. Stepped um, away from the spotlight, but he's still here today. Yes. Yeah, work and study. And now you do kids' music mostly, right? Well, I do. Well, um, I've done, yes, a lot of kids' music, and I teach a lot. Um, I, I, work with, I work with kids. Right now I'm actually teaching uh, in public schools here in New Mexico and um, in, in Santa Fe. And I've also done some some sound design and music for some big theater projects over the last couple of years. So that's been another big activity. Right. And then Chase, whose stuff I have been listening to just, just today. Tell no. Thanks. Um, Where are you calling from? Yeah, so I'm uh, here in Atlanta, technically uh, Loganville, which is in about halfway in between Atlanta and Athens, Georgia. So... Um, but, the uh, project is Golden Bear, is that right? <laughs> it's just um, a side name, a nickname um, that I use to post stuff. Uh, once I actually physically release everything, I'll have it under my own name. But, um, but yeah, so I've played in bands since I was a teenager, um, high school and college. Uh, and these days I pretty much just keep to myself and uh, write my own music solo, singer-songwriter, folk-type stuff. And immaculate-sounding recordings, i got to say. Um, thank you. Adrian, I don't know anything about you. Tell us tell us where <laughs> you are and what's, who you are. Hi, yeah, uh, sorry, I've been coming in and out because of my computer's being silly, but I think it's sorted out. Uh, so, yeah, my name's uh, Adrian. I usually go by Cho, so my last name is Cho. Um... I'm in Dallas, and it's also very sunny here. Very, very hot day. Um, As see. it should be. As it <laughs> should be. Oh, I want to go back to Michigan. It's too <laughs> hot. <laughs> um, uh, musically, let's see. Uh, I don't. I'm not in any bands, but I'm. Uh, I sing with Dallas Symphony Chorus, and oh, nice. I play piano and classical guitar. So I'm more. I'm more from like the classical. Tradition. I'm trying to learn some jazz, etc. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Good. Good representation here. And then, um, Mr. Mike, Michael Patrick Wilson. Yes. Can you're you're I'm muted? Mute. Yes, I'm trying to unmute. <laughs> you're supposed to be the tech guy. <laughs> well. <laughs> All right. Tell us your deal. Ah, there we go. Hey. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Mike Wilson. Uh, I live in the East Bay in Northern California near San Francisco where the weather is perfect. And uh, I was a... Uh, my definition. It, it's almost always perfect. And um, uh, I was trying to think of the first time I collaborated with Mark Linsenmeyer, um, who lived down the dorm for me my freshman year, 25 years ago. And uh, yeah, 25 years of, uh, of collaborating once every seven or eight years <laughs> or something, I don't know. But um, yes, uh, Mark was uh, one of the first musical people I ran into when I started at the University of Michigan a long time ago. 
It's nearly four <laughs> collaborations every seven days. That's, yeah, probably. that's probably about the size of it. We did one gig together on yeah. at a coffee house, and there was a lot of swearing in the song, and people walked out. <laughs> at least one angry old man, not like our swearing, stormed out of the coffee shop. So we're all musicians here, pretty much. One form or another, yeah. That was the idea. When I advertised this, I, I sort of, uh, <laughs> I was a little heavy-handed about that. I was, I was afraid, I was afraid we'd be full. Besides which, since we're not going to be talking about Nietzsche or something, I didn't think there would be just any random non-music fans. Well, I am trying to get a Nietzsche mustache going, but it's not very successful. So. You can do it. I, I see we, we we might have on the call Warren Fisher. Can you hear us, Warren? Yeah, I'm, I'm working. <laughs> I think he can hear us, but we can't hear him. Okay, hold on. All right. Oh. Okay. I heard that. Nearly there. I don't know what's going on. Thank you very much. Oh, hey guys, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay, really sorry about that. Warren Fisher, does, does anybody else on the call know that name to know what band he's from? Oh, boy. With Fisher? It's a pretty obscure band. Fisher Spooner. Anyway, this is a band that I had heard of, and then he was he was following me, or we were connected on Facebook for two years before I realized like that I knew this guy's band, and I had uh -huh. CDs sitting on my shelf. So we've been uh, <laughs> we've been conversing today about how uh, how horribly sentimentalist the folks on the call were, and in, in in neglecting electronic music, which is Fisher Spooner's uh, starting point. But I think we should. Uh, Maybe before uh, we should let Chris have the opening volley as a, as a band member of the guys, oh. former band member of the guys we interviewed. What what did you hear on in the discussion that made you say, "You stupid bastards"? Or, <laughs> or have any other reactions? That was good. I, I actually I listened to I, I was able to listen to a little more than half of the discussion, and um, yeah, I think there's some really there's some really good. Good issues that got brought up, you know, particularly around you know, internet commerce and music. And we all have, we all, we're all confronting that. And um, so part of my take on it is, um, well, I think some, some of the conditions, the conditions are becoming kind of more and more severe. You know, a lot, a lot of the the wealth that's being generated is is getting sucked up by fewer and fewer people. Um, there's I have kind of a twas ever thus sort of attitude about it. I mean, art and commerce have always been, or art and the economy have always been in this tension. And you know, um, you know, all the all the famous dead white guy musicians, you know, composers were employees, you know, for, for the most part for a very long time. They had to be employees of somebody, you know, a wealthy person, um, and so it's. Um, you know, I don't think that tension is ever going to go away, and it's um, you know, as as artists, you know, a lot of us nowadays we have to straddle both. We have to have a foot in both uh, in, in, in both areas. You know, we have to because we're, we're in a position where we have to manage our own you know, economic survival. We can't just like sign on the dot, sign on the bottom line, and, and get a big advance to make a bunch of records. Um, so there's definitely a trade-off because, you know, because in you know in the heyday of all that stuff, you know you sign to the bottom line, you got a big advance, but then you uh, a book for the rest of your life or however many albums you know, in the company had all the power. So it's it's uh, it's another it's sort of the next the next version of that same battle that, that we probably always have to artists will probably always have to fight. Anybody want to run with that? Uh, I have thoughts on that topic. Um, so, um, completely agree that there's always a strange dynamic between art and commerce. Um, what I found interesting about the discussion that you guys had was there was, again, um, nostalgia for a time when music was limited and it was difficult to access it. I remember living in Madison, there were a few record stores, and I would buy anything that was in the genres of music that I could find. And I was desperate for access to music, 
and we now have all you know getting closer to unlimited access which I think is an amazing thing for listeners um, and musicians alike um, so I, I do think it, there's there's an irony in the fact that we all liked it better when it was you had to put music onto a vinyl platter and that process was something inaccessible to people so that was the leverage point with which to charge money for it which ultimately trickled down to artists but um, that was a, just a temporary technological sort of moment in the way the history of recorded music operated but it's interesting that musicians um, are nostalgic for that um, and, uh, you know, as for, you know, I mean, I think musicians just want to get paid, you know, somehow. <laughs> and that's what it boils down to. And everybody wants to make a living doing what they want to do. And, um, but I think for somebody who's into more, you know, sort of obscure music, um, can you, I mean, the renaissance that's happening right now is mind-blowing, the things that you can get access to. I mean, I remember in, when I lived in Chicago in the early 90s, Again, after Madison, I would be on. I would get paid on Friday, and I would travel by train to five different record stores, every, and it was virtually every payday, every payday. And I'd get a stack of records, and half of them were really shitty, and that was just the process by which I discovered music. So anyway, you could argue that things are way better. Is my point. You know, it's interesting when we talk about music being split up and split up and get basically the user experience, you, you know, me and everybody on my block could, ha could be listening to a different band and none of us could have ever heard of any of them and so on. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a comedian who um, his act, a lot of it is uh, spoofing songs, you know, that people listen to. So he said he thinks it's uh, it's getting to the point where he can't do it anymore because there were, you know, not everybody knows the same songs like they used to, which is a good thing and it's a bad thing because there was something that um, unif that kind of brought people together by, you know, having access to the same few songs where we we could all wind up, uh, you know, singing together on something. It was something that united us. But uh, what are people's take on that? Well, they. The nostalgia of the 60s came up in, in the original podcast where they were talking about how that was a time of, you know, you know great artistic breakthroughs and things like that. But I, the 60s to me always seemed like a winner-take-all thing. I mean, like the winners of that would fly their helicopter down to the pub and, you know, there's all kinds of rock and roll. That's when rock and roll excess was born. And I, I think it, it, things got unified so much that it turned into kind of a, I mean, such a... There's such a concentration at the top where you know everybody was unified, but they all like the same like handful of bands who turned into like trillionaires. Which you know contrasted with now, it's the absolute opposite where musicians don't get paid at all. But um, yeah, I found it a little weird. Like the nostalgia for the '60s is as if it wasn't commercial. It was intensely commercial. I mean, if you watch the Peanuts Christmas special, Snoopy in the '60s was complaining about, or someone was complaining about Snoopy going commercial or something like that. So. I mean, that that complaint existed back then, and in in a way, I think it was almost. I mean, that's when the commerciality really took hold, in in my opinion. Well, I'll respond to that by saying that that even though I, I was just I came across an article recently that the music business is down. I don't know what the exact numbers are, so I'm going to misquote this, but it was something like they the industry generated in 2000 it generated like 25 billion dollars and now it's generating 13 billion dollars so it's gone way down but there's still I would argue that that's still alive that there there's still your Beyonce's there's still your Jay-Z's and there, there's still your Miley Cyrus's and you know there there's a level at which you can make a ton of money I just think there's fewer people in that it's sort of like the middle class of musicians so I, in a way I'm kinda of disagreeing I would say there used to be more of a middle class because everybody had to purchase their music at, at all different levels and so now the middle class is gone and there's just the extremely rich but I do you know I mean obviously there were a lot of excesses uh, and there was a lot of money to be made through selling records in the 70s particularly um, so you know you're right about that I will one point I will say that I love about the 60s is it went from you know kind of hokey 
rock and roll all the way to Black Sabbath. And you have to think about there was Motown, the Beatles, and, you know, Rolling Stones, and, you know, all kinds of different versions of hard rock, like Cream and everything. There was a lot of just creativity there. Um, so, anyway. Just on a side note. That was more of a side note. I do appreciate the 60s for that. Oh, a thought I had uh, that I would uh, turn over quite a bit, um, not so much recently, but a few years ago, was the, um, the way you know, music was proliferating via, you know, through the internet and so forth, um, and mass mass culture that, in the way that we've been talking about it was sort of breaking down with less, uh, like less direct industry control. But you had you had this phenomenon where um, live music was becoming more important again um, because you can't. It's harder to, for instance, it's harder to make money through recordings, and so. Whereas a band used to um, used to tour in order to support record sales, now they're giving the recordings away for free to get people to come to shows, and and so you have this kind of weird uh, flip uh, in how some aspects of the you know, music economy work, and in a way it's kind of a return to a time uh, perhaps before. Before recording and before all that, exactly. Control, where live music matters, and it matters to a smaller, um, to a smaller group that have your audience that you have to cultivate. Um, of course, the big difference is now your audience might be scattered all, you know, scattered all over creation, and you can't just you can't speak to them all at, you know, at one concert, or you can't you know play in one place and have your whole audience come together. It's a little, it's, it's different that way, but. Um, you, you're working to cultivate this this one this group of people, and it's not um, it's not possible to try and reach a mass audience just because there's such a you know there's such a volume of stuff to choose from. But you can reach the people who you, know, you can connect more directly with the people who do like what you do and do you respond to. It. I'm almost amazed that that. Touring still exists, given given the technolo technology that we now have at our disposal. You know, it seems like it's only a matter of time before, you know, can I set up uh, uh, my you know, do a band rehearsal and film it with our holographic projectors and stream the uh, stream the result over the internet? So all my so you you know you could have a virtual gig without touring anymore, right. and it would be basically certainly probably more pleasant than being in a smelly bar. Uh, Right. right. You were yeah. talking about this in the episode. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, please go. Uh, Mark, just the idea of uh, live performance has this certain. Uh, I'm trying to remember the word that you that you. Uh, it had, you were talking about the perception of authenticity, I, I, I believe, and in that conversation, you talked about uh, live performance and the effect that live performance has versus recorded performance. Do you remember that? Uh, I know that was something that Victor was very concerned about. Uh, anyway, you know, we, even when he did, did the recordings, that you know, trying to do it as live as possible, so that that would have some authenticity for it. I'm more. I don't. I, I would. I think musicians themselves tend to overestimate how much listeners care about <laughs> the musician point of view. In other words, you know, a guitarist might be, you know, look, I'm doing an extra fancy thing on guitar, but only other guitarists are really going to appreciate how cool this thing I'm doing on guitar is. Uh, and likewise, like, a, you know, a friend of mine that was in a band with me used to say, I don't, I, I like to hear songs where I can really picture, where they don't do a lot of extra overdubbing, because I want to be able to kind of picture all the musicians doing their thing. And, and so if you layer nine layers of vocals or whatever on it, there's something that just fell flat for him about that. Again, that's only from somebody who's either a musician themselves or maybe really immersed in the culture of watching live music. I could admit there be, might be you, fans that are like that, but I'm not one of those. Like I, I think the listener, from the listener point of view, they don't really care. Like they, the sounds have to be cool, uh, but but as to it sounding like it's live or something, eh. I think there's a connection you build with the performer by seeing them live. Like you're like, you know what? I was in the same room with that person. They're real. That person exists. They're alive. 
We were there. We and, experienced and, this together. Yeah, and my information is, despite what you're saying, Mark, that touring, that's the area of the business that's growing. And that you, they're, they're, these are undownloadable experiences. Yeah, people are experimenting with live YouTube broadcasts. But, um, you know, touring, like the people, the company that owns Coachella and GovBall and other festivals, like the company that owns those two is now doing record deals. Because, and what they do is they give you a deal that actually makes sense, which is we're going to book you on, this, on these 10 festivals in Europe and 10 festivals in North America – we're going to pre-book you at X dollars per gig, and we're going to give you an advance of like half of that money for you to finish your record, and you're pre-agreeing to go to these festival dates. So the importance of live music is is growing. I think that's I think people have a fetish for reality, in a sense. <laughs> and and I think that in a world of filled with screens and hours and hours and hours of looking at screens, there's, uh, there's a deep desire for that on some basic level. And so, anyway, I think that's where music is actually thriving. Right. I've noticed. Of course, uh, oh, I'm sorry. You can, you can go. No, please go ahead. Go ahead. Please. Oh, um, well, at least in my experience, I listen to a lot of uh, singer-songwriter folk, indie-type uh, music, and over, I'd say over the past five, six years, I've noticed a lot more indie musicians going the direction of a DIY house show kind of thing. Um, a lot of acts out of the uh, Pacific Northwest, uh, David Bazan, Damian Gerardo, Rocky Vadalado, those kind of guys. Um, they basically just, because we're all so connected with the technology, they'll just send emails out to their fan base, say, hey, we're doing a tour. It's going through these cities if you want to volunteer. Um, your house will come and do like a, a two-hour set. No, no stages. No, you know, back lines. No sound systems. Just the artist, you know, their guitar and a pe group of people sitting on the floor interacting. Um, so it's kind of gone back to more of a, uh, I guess, more of a primal, immediate kind of thing. I don't know if that's a backlash or if that's just an evolution of where touring is gone, um, but um, I've been to a number of those shows, and it's a it's a lot a lot of fun to be able to literally have the person right in front of you and oh, yeah. have conversations in between songs. And it, that's really interesting. It's cutting out all the middlemen. It almost right. sounds like sounds like Uber for live music, you know, um, which <laughs> yeah. which makes a lot of sense to me. It, that makes a lot of sense because you can go right to the people and you can negotiate directly and, you know, you can make an exchange. Exactly, um, yeah. It, it, it really, you know, if you think about the 20th century, that was a century when recording recorded music was invented and it was a blip, where you, historically speaking, of when it was very difficult for people to get access to recorded music and it was really expensive. And now we're reverting back to pre-20th century in my, you know, one way mm -hmm. of looking at it, maybe. Um, where it's like people would travel around and perform and people would congregate to see live music and the recorded music becomes kind of like the flyer for those performances. Potentially, this is a possible interpretation. Well, right. I, I, actually, I, I, was, I was amused when you referred to um, a desire for, for reality or real experience as a fetish. I think it seemed to me like it's the, the other way, you know, the fetishistic part is, is more the technology steps the other way around. I mean, um, being with other people and you know, we're social creatures, so that's that's something that we that we miss on a deep level. And the technology, for all its uh, promise of connectivity, a lot of that connectivity is very superficial. And this this is the the experience that we. Miss and crave, and uh, and are, are seizing out partly because of, and in, I think in no small measure, in spite of the technology. Stands right. I I always feel like it's um kind of like the cloud, you know. Uh, everybody puts everything in the cloud. You put your books in the cloud. You put your CDs in the cloud. See, Mark's got all the CDs behind him, <laughs> but uh, a lot of people put all their <laughs> albums in the cloud. Put your books in the cloud. You put your videos in the cloud, and 
in my mind, it just keeps going that way, right? And eventually, you just wind up putting your furniture in the cloud. Everything is in the cloud. Like, you don't, you wind up, you come home, and it's a completely empty house. And then you're just dying for something physical, you know? So, so like, I feel like the one fetish leads to the other. Like, Chris, you're talking about the technology. Like, the more people are going to get into the technology, the less they're going to have the reality. And then right. eventually they're going to crave what they don't have because of the rules of supply and demand. So, you know. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought... That's I'm all gonna... I had to say. Sorry. Uh, all that involves a lot of commitment, both from the, the, the fan and the artist, to uh, travel around and perform for small audiences. And what I've always wondered is, can you make a living doing that? I mean, can you actually travel around, perform to the you know one one hundredth of one percent of the people in a particular area that are really into you enough to, to show up with, you know, decent chunks of money and and continue doing that. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I've never been like a, a working paid musician, so I have no idea. But can you actually make a living doing that? I, I think I know. Um, sorry. You can. I was saying, I think people do it. It's hard. But. Yeah, it's just if you're good. <laughs> I think there's a lot more to it than being good. Right. Um, you have to have the skills to, right, and the chutzpah, shall we say, to um, you know to kind of to kind of push yourself and, and get out there and make those connections. It's, but see, that's the thing. It's like now, it's and this is the thing that is difficult for a lot of musicians who are very good at what they do. Is you don't have someone um, you. You don't have someone who's taking the cut of what you make and doing it for you. You know, someone who's um, who is all chutzpah and all networking and taking that over. You've got to, and this is the, um, um, what's his name? Jaron Lanier has been writing, you know, he's been writing articles, sort of, um, cautioning us about uh, about where a lot of this stuff is going and where he was describing uh, artists and musicians in particular in his. Uh, Estimation. They're kind of canaries in the coal mine. You know, it's like um, the way you know, it's such a, it's such a scramble, and it's and it's so um, now everybody has to be their own business person as well as their own maker, and so that's um, it's tough. You know, you've got to you've got to got to work a lot to do that. I, mean, I have a day job, so seems <laughs> like as the technology has expanded, the responsibility in a lot of respects has expanded with that. Whereas yes. you know, you used to, bands used to just have a manager and a publicity guy, and um, the label did a lot of the work, and um, and now you know, it's pretty much up to you to to be the marketing and the creation process. And I think the real question nobody's asking is, what is a living? You know, <laughs> what do you consider a living? All this living. Exactly. <laughs> right. Indeed. Indeed. I, I want to bring Adrian into this. What, what, what is the classical perspective on all this stuff we're talking about? Um, you uh, now represent all of classical music. You. <laughs> right there right now. Okay, I'll, I'll give you the definitive statement. What do you play? Classical music. Now, I play, well, I sing, and um, I play piano, classical guitar sort of thing. Um... I wonder, um, I don't know if I have too much to say about the economics, about the classical music. I mean, it's pretty much similar, right? It's, it's, it's tough living um, for classical musicians as well. And I'm not a professional musician, so I, don't, I can't tell you that much about it. Um, I do wonder about, um, I guess uh, this is steering the conversation in a bit of a different direction. I Please. Have what, sorry, go ahead. No, please hear us. Oh, um, okay. Well, I wonder about authenticity um, about in classical music and uh, when you guys are talking about that on the episode. Um, and, you know, uh, if... Because, right, classical musicians mostly play music that's not written um, by themselves. It's written, for, written by other people. And... I was wondering whether there's something, well, inauthentic, inauthentic about that, right? Um, could you say that? I'm not really sure. I'm just bringing up the question. Sure you can. 
t-shirt. Yeah, you can, you, mean, can, you can totally say that. And, sure. And you now, and uh, not uh, apologies for a talking a lot and b. I'm about to sound like the know-it-all guy with music, so I apologize <laughs> for that. But um, so my mother was an opera singer. My best friend in high school's mother played violin. I grew up playing violin, and she played violin professionally in the Madison Symphony. And so I saw what her life was like and how much money she got. And I'm also aware of how the cl classical musical world's trending, by the way, just going back to that, which is not mm. good. Mm. And G, um, they're losing money. They're, like everybody's, like people go to opera are 80 years old. It's a problem. <laughs> it's a real problem for them. But so that's that. the point up there. The opera should just go to people's houses. They should tour around the country. <laughs> <and go> around. <laughs> But as far as playing music that other people wrote, I think that's a really interesting issue. And I think that Yasha Heifetz is not as, you know, valuable or expressive as Stravinsky was, who created. And so I think, in my view, there is a hierarchy of value. But it's it's an interesting exercise because you're interpreting somebody else's expressive like expression and. Uh, you know, and it applies to symphonies and all forms of classical music. It's um, it's what makes jazz so great is that you can't really do that with jazz. It's always combined with the performer really dramatically. Right. Um, but, yeah, no, I think it is. You know, now, for example, um, I was uh, Paganini is a violinist, very incredible violinist from, like, the 1700s or something. He was he toured around. He was so good that he had to write his own music. And I think, you know, I, I don't know. I just think there's something more interesting there than – Somebody who just plays other people's music, but anyway, that's my. I think, thing. Mark, what you were talking about in the episode about Taylor Swift, uh, I thought well, that was it. Yeah. Uh, if I, if anything, <laughs> I didn't want to be the guy who was like defending Taylor Swift too much on the episode, <laughs> given uh, the people that I was talking to. But given that I've, since my daughter, like that for a while, that was like all she would listen to. But I've heard every Taylor Swift album a lot of times, and. I have no problem with it. Like, <laughs> like there's definitely, a, 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 you know, the, the the production values did not, for me, interfere with it being an authentic expression of a 16-year-old girl writing about stuff. Like, if that's what you want, it's and it seems to work just fine. Um, but uh, you know, I th I thought that at least my conclusion at the end of it was this whole authenticity thing. Uh, well, I compared it to. Uh, uh, being fashionable, and I did not mean that it's just like, oh, you know, shouldn't worry about that. Being, don't worry about being fashionable. That's stupid. Don't worry about being authentic. That's stupid. I was, I was concerned about it uh, that it's, it's a spectator-related thing rather than a creator-related thing. So I think it's legitimate as, mm. as a person listening to something. Interesting. To say, is mm -hmm. this coming from a person, or is this coming from a corporation that put this together to make something right. to my tastes, imitating right. people? Who actually had something to say? Like that is, as a listener, that's important. But as a creator, you already know whether you're a person or a corporation or something. Yeah. Like it's not even an issue. So mm. I just, it, it was kind of weird mm -hmm. that, that Victor himself, you know, that was that had to do with his own his own progression uh, as somebody who was trying to delve deep into the blues uh, and these other traditional forms, which is kind of a strange foreign thing to me. It's not something that resonates with me that much. I would rather use traditional forms to make something new and crazy, not try to get back to the authentic 1940s stuff. So I was interested to hear about his struggles with that, uh, though I don't ultimately... Uh, well, and, and I guess there's a question right there that he, he was taking as his, his paradigm of authenticity, you know, getting in and playing really old blues numbers, but... Those are mostly not, you know, those are those are folk songs. Uh, often, often right, going back far enough. Right. Yeah. So you're playing something somebody else wrote. You're playing something maybe the the words have been going around the culture for a long time. Like how, yet you could still think that's authentic. So obviously, there are different pictures of authenticity at work here. Yeah. yeah well, it's, certainly. You know, it's, um, I mean, in the case of folk music, I mean, folk music is by definition, something that belongs to everyone and no one. And so everybody, every performance, every version is an authentic version of you know, this, this thing, this idea that we all recognize and pass around and carry with us. It's, it's something to share. And I think that's 
Christ. You know, I think that is the expression generally. It's like everybody listens. You, you listen to somebody, you pick up something, you know, you incorporate it into what you do, um, whether it's you know, literally lifting, you know, lifting a sample or just or learning a lick or inflecting your voice a certain way. Um, we're all that's that's just part of the process of music as you know, as a human activity. It's something we share. Hey, before we go on, I wanted to acknowledge that we had a late arrival, Max Bartko, who is Hi. another guy, along with uh, 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 Michael, that I worked on our Evil 12 Days of Christmas thing this <laughs> last uh, holiday season, which is how I hooked up with Jonathan Segel in the first place and why we ended up having this episode. So that's historical. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Your, your, Thank uh, you for that. Mostly okay, an sure. electronic guy, right, Max? Or what, I'm sorry. Could you say that one more time? Electronic yeah, yeah. So I, um, I'm an electronic musician. I'm a, a rapper. I've been a rapper for a long time, actually. Um, but the contributions that I've been putting here are mostly uh, electronic. Yeah. <laughs> um, got a and, lot of crap about the episode from people that are into electronic music and rap and. Interesting. Did you want to channel any of that, or did you not have that reaction? Um, well, I mean, I think. Um, what really permeated, what, what permeates my um, experience with music and, and was really at work when I was listening to the episode is um, I also grew up with a kind of indie rock kind of uh, uh, sense of authenticity and looking for the authenticity. Um, and eventually I was very scarred to realize that all of my tastes were constructed by a corporate machine, that my desires that that what I believed was real um, was or at least you know, mediated through it. Yeah, it, yeah and, and I mean, uh, and there's a bizarre kind of authenticity in embracing how um, constructed you are, which was a part of the like industrial movement of the 1980s. Um, and I I'm still a little bit lost here. I don't know what to do with that. And especially if you look at art history, um, there was this idea before like the more enlightenment humanist kind of art values where authenticity was something about the self and bringing you to a universal experience. There was this idea of authenticity actually being continuing a tradition and putting as little of yourself in the work as possible. Um, well, that's, that's certainly that's true with a lot of strains of computer music. I'm not going to lie. You know, the, music, the composer is actually constructing systems that once you set to run, Actually, generate the music for you, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that was going back as far as you know, the, you know, Zanakis and people like that were, um, were doing, mm -hmm. and, and uh, yeah, all these composers in the mid mid century were, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, getting into and, that, uh, and uh, and Mozart, Mozart just wrote music, poor fellow. I saw the movie. He got, he got in the front with his harpsichord. He <laughs> smiled at the audience. He wasn't just a writer. He was a performer. <laughs> I have a question for Max, though. Um, you, sure. You mentioned that it bothered you that uh, to learn that your music was arriving via you know some corporate distribution and was packaged. Mm -hmm. So why did it bother you? Oh, it bothered me because um, the whole... I, I, Mark summed up, I think, you know, the authenticity thing as, as a listener really well. Um, and, but I don't think that this goes. This ends up going away as when you're a performer, it gets more insidious. The the idea that is this coming from me or is this coming from a machine? Is this coming from a sort of like um, uh, and it seems pretty straightforward when there is a you know where you have you know Iggy Pop, you know he's this you know he's a junkie. He couldn't couldn't get a corporation together if he tried. You know he's just out there you know sweating and doing his thing. And then you have a team of suits behind them that are altering the sound and marketing and it seems you know there seems to be this dialectic of authenticity and you know kind of corporate values there whereas um, whereas now now those uh, those suits and the performer are like the same person um, there's no like at the end of the day um, instead of there being like this uh, this kind of I'm not sure if I'm communicating this well but instead of there being this opposition, like a clear opposition between people who are in it for the music and expressing the human experience 
and people that are trying to make a buck, um, those things have collapsed. The thing, the thing that isn't a, like a sort of expression of the human experience is trying to make a buck. Like trying to make a buck is it ends up becoming like a, a valid expression of the human experience because it's so central to our lives. Um, and so that this challenged my own conception not only as a listener but as a performer. That um, all the all the music I grew up with, you know, my Pink Floyd was like a holy relic to me. You know what I mean? Um, and I only really listened to Pink Floyd because my dad showed me Pink Floyd, and my dad heard it on the radio, and my dad didn't understand that Young Lust was a satiric tune, you know, making fun of um, cock rock, you know what I mean? And just kind of listened to it, you know, for, for on face value, but he really enjoyed it, and he passed it on to me. And there was a total authentic experience I was having within this extremely mediated realm. Um, and I guess, yeah, the problem is, is that um, I want to, I, I, the feelings I was getting was this what Schopenhauer is talking about, this sense that art brings you to the universal of humanity, um, whereas I'm really dealing with this, like, you know, particular uh, set of trends that was, you know, really in the mid-70s. Like, fuck. <laughs> well, it, actually, it, just because you brought up Pink Floyd, I watched a couple of documentaries recently, and the fact that they describe it, or Roger Waters describes it, as their shared goal as a band was to become millionaires. Like, that is what their goal And this is yeah. one of the most sort of creative yes. artistic bands of the time, and that's sort of why it fell apart, because they became millionaires, and then, like, eh, <laughs> I don't think I need to write songs anymore. Okay, so they took care of that. Job done. Yeah. yeah. So that's so that disturbed me as a listener, um, and and especially when I started making music and trying to go for the authentic, because I think this is what makes indie rock people abandon indie rock and look for you know previous traditions like the blues. Or for me, it was I went even further into you know mediated land and I went to hip hop, um, which you know is like literally composed of cut up you know disco bricks you know, at its inception, you know, it's like, it's, it's, people do make the authenticity argument with hip-hop, but it's even harder, like, it's even harder to is sustain. It, is it the lyrical perspective that I'm, you know, whether it's I'm from the streets or whatever, it hap you happen to be perspe uh, yeah. communicating the rap, but that seems, it, what about even just surely the instrumentals, is that even a concern yeah. of uh, authenticity, uh, you know, or is it that, am I sampling too much, is it, is it, is it that kind uh, of question? Both, both. Um, there's the question of hip hop's cultural particularity because if you've noticed, all all of most of the music we're talking about comes from like American black traditions uh, and eventually is subsumed, like taken away from those traditions and kind of not really associated with them anymore. You know, the blues, I think, uh, you know, old white dudes, jazz, old white dudes, rock and roll, middle aged white dudes. You know what I mean? Um, but hip hop has kind of evaded um, that kind of institutionalization. Because it's it is it's supposed supposedly associated still with the black experience in America. Even though if I go to a, you know the hip hop shows in San Francisco, it's a bunch of crunchy granola hippie MCs. You know what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, so there's that, and then there there's a whole debate, especially in the 80s and 90s, where there's um, and in, in the 2000s, where there's an idea of you know how to sample authentically. Um, what is an authentic if you sample something that other people had already sampled, is that authentic? Or are you copying people that, you know, that, are you copying their sampling? Like if I sample the same records that Dr. Dre sampled, that's not an original sample. Or um, I've heard rappers articulate that if you can only play instruments, if you only, you know, fuck with keyboards, if you can only play instruments and you don't know how to use samples, that you're inauthentic. Like I've heard it from every angle. <laughs> every angle. Like... It's crazy, and and the thing like you know it's it's like combing through a metaphysics textbook and being left with the aporia at the end of like I don't know what's authentic, like I don't know. Right. Well, authentic sample just sounds like an oxymoron to me, <laughs> which doesn't right. mean it's not it's not fine to do, but why why trouble yourself? You know, I, I you know when I think about when I use samples, I I don't use I usually. We yeah. use samples and work at the yeah. level of you know notes of you know of the soonest. Uh, yeah. playing you know 
going up and down and, and putting their instrument to their faces and taking very careful samples so that you can have a bassoon in your computer and make use of it. Um, I mean, it's, I don't know, the question yeah. kind of go away at that point. It's, yeah. it's, there's a whole set of right. As long right. as you successfully put the bassoonist out of business. Well, <laughs> see, that's the thing. If I, well, well, see, here's, and here's the thing. If I could afford to hire a bassoonist, I would do. I would choose to do that first because I would rather mm. work with a musician. Mm -hmm. But I can't afford to choose a bassoonist. And where I live, I don't know where I would. Actually, I could probably go find one in Santa Fe but, um, or Albuquerque. But, you know, they're miles away, and you know, I, could, I couldn't afford to do that. Or I would. So that's, I mean, that's, that's my, that's me. That's my preference. Mm -hmm. um, and I still have, I, for instance, have hesitations about when I'm working on percussion tracks. Mm -hmm. If I got a song, I sort of, I, I think twice, or I hesitate, and I do it anyway, but I, I try to, mm -hmm. I end up using something that sounds like a drum kit, but I thought, I don't really have a drummer. I should mm -hmm. use sounds that aren't quite, that aren't real drum samples. I should make it sound a little electronic. So, you know, yeah. I, I have a I have a moral or an ethical uh -huh. uh, a, a hiccup for me there. You know, and it, a lot of times I end up I've had I use it anyway because the electronic stuff is just not right for what I'm trying to do. But mm -hmm. if I if I had a studio and I could afford a drummer, I would bring a drummer in. And so, anyway, I mean those those are things that those that's how I think about it. Mm -hmm. But if I'm doing something purely electronic, then or or Consciously sampled. I mean, those are those are not issues. Yeah, I think um, in terms of authenticity, I think it kind of might have a two-pronged approach because you obviously you you would have the authenticity if you're just sitting down with an instrument and creating right. something, you know, from from your own mind, your own will, or whatnot. Um, but I think it also applies to giving your own um, interpretation of something that could already exist. I know, for example, a few years ago I was really into finding track stems. Um, mm. uh, like I know Trent Reznor at one yeah. point released like a bunch of Nine Inch Nails individual tracks and he just encouraged people to mix, you know, and he would give it to you in the different formats that people might need. Um, but even even putting your own touch on something that's been pre-recorded already, um, I think I would I would definitely consider that to be authentic. It's just in in a different vein with a with a different technology. Um, I know for the the most recent record I made, um, there was a lot of synthetics involved, where we were having to um, program synths or drums because uh, we were just recording in a bedroom, so we, we couldn't really get a drummer in there with a um, you know enough mics and didn't really know what we were doing enough to record, record it the way it should sound. Um, but I think um, a lot of it would just depend on your approach. If if you're authentically trying to to create something and be innovative, I think a lot of it has to do with your intentions and the approach you take in the process. Um, Is it possible to be accidentally inauthentic? <laughs> oh, yeah. I would think so, yeah. I know a lot of my best ideas have come after I've recorded something and I'm playing around in post-production and and then you you take something that was a mistake or uh, not what you intended and it ends up being your favorite part of the um, of the production, so. Or you, or you go th you, you go through the whole trouble of uh, of writing and recording a tune and then you stop and think, wait a minute, I should check around and make sure that I'm actually not Actually, just reproducing something that I heard, you know, never, never, like five years ago. Yeah, that's the worst. Is when you realize you completely ripped someone off and <laughs> you didn't even realize it. Just parallel yeah. thinking, right? You know, there's just so much stuff out yeah, there. That's at a certain said, point. Yeah. Right. That, that said, I mean, who, you know, you, how many times have you heard something, heard a tune, and go and you know, these two bars of it is like, oh, that's also this, you know, and, but of course, Twinkle yeah. Twinkle and Little Star and ABC are the same song, so, so, so that's fine. <laughs> it seems as fairly... As, as long as it's you slobbering the words over it, 
then you could say it's authentically you. I mean, you know, it's, it's that's what rock and roll is. It's the same freaking three chords or whatever. Exactly. But because it's you and not somebody else that's slobbering over it, then it's authentic. Yeah. Sure. It's, it's sorry, newness. Sorry, Danny, what... sorry? sorry you, you were saying uh, something, Danny? Yeah, no, I was just saying that at a certain point, um, it's impossible to be completely original or, or authentic. Uh, it's all been regurgitated before, and uh, pretty much what you said, as long as it's coming from your point of view and it's you're not blatantly trying to rip somebody off, you're trying to express yourself, you, you, you may find that your expression is similar to somebody else's, as long as you're not stealing from somebody. You know, but if you you could kill yourself, uh, if you if you, I guarantee you anything you've ever written, if you did some kind of search with some computer algorithm uh, algorithm and 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 uh, and looked for the the keys or the bars or the notes that you wrote, you'll probably find like uh, you know ten thousand bands that wrote a similar song. You know, so at a certain point, you just have to sort of. You know, be honest and uh, and come from your point of view, uh, and and put out put out a little piece of your soul, and 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 know that that's also uh, been shaped by everybody else's souls around you. You know, it's all been absorbed into the big uh, universal sponge. You know. So so, Danny, when you, I would think it's harder for for you as a comedian. I know whenever I think of a new pun, like a, a stupid name for a product or something, I will always look up the pun, and it's always used. It's always an actual product out there. There's, right. At least with that kind of humor. And I guess that's a that's an argument for not having that kind of jokes in your repertoire anymore. If that's, <laughs> something it, it is an it. argument for that. I mean, that's, uh, that's a big point uh, that you just made. What I, what I think is yeah. uh, the comedy that I do now... I just try to make it very uh, much my experience. I talk about stuff that I did personally, that I've been doing, that uh, thoughts that I had about what I did or when I was. You know, it, it, it's authentic to me. It's what I've been through. It's not, oh, I think I found something clever here that, uh, you know, that stuff has been done, you know, between George Carlin and you know, playing with the language and, uh, I don't even know, pun-wise, who, who is really good, but, uh... Well, but even observational humor, if you're... Did you ever notice that, well, yeah, if you noticed it, probably they have noticed it, too. Probably the 10,000 other comedians before you also noticed that thing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. that's, part of, that's part of the humor, is the reason it's humorous is because it resonates with people. Also go, oh yeah, yeah, I've been there. Right. So if it, so if oh, you're trying to be truly that. idiosyncratic, then you're searching for something, then searching for something that resonates is at cross purposes with something idiosyncratic. Right. And I think you can. I mean, you could look at, um, you look at the popularity of someone like Louis C.K. or Mark Maron. I mean, those are strictly um, like confessional type. I know we had mentioned confessional type songwriting, but that's. It seems like um, a lot of their humor comes from that type of expression, um, and clearly it, it resonates with a lot of people, um, so uh, yeah, it's hard to deny that, for sure. Yeah. yeah, there's always also this, like, do you ever notice kind of jokes kind of piss me off sometimes, where it's like, uh, do you ever notice that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I noticed that, thanks. <laughs> what are you even saying? You're just pointing out. You, you see that tree? Yeah, I see that tree. Huh? Isn't that some kind of tree? Oh, I'll be yeah. here all night. You know? So what's the because some people really do that. Like, there's a lot of comics that I see, like, probably nobody you've ever heard of, uh, and maybe you never will hear of, but they're 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 little little plant planted on so many little shows that you do, where all the they're doing is trying to bring up some nostalgia to win over the, win over the crowd, like uh, onions, funions, mm. right? Or or or, uh, <laughs> or or some you know like some reference from Mario Brothers or some re like these are I call them the reference comics. They're just like mm. really you know you just look in the back of the book and 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 uh, and you can see like 
all the references, you know? It's like the clip so, aid of comedy. So. Yeah, they, they just, <laughs> they're, now they're not even saying to even notice. They're just saying, remember? So you're calling That's, inauthenticity mm. on that. <laughs> What's that? You're calling inauthenticity on that, right? But at what point do you stop no, being... It's not, it's not about inauthenticity. It's just about... Uh, Poor joke writing, you know. It's not. Mm, mm. It's, it's just. It's not even. It's not even really a joke. It's. I feel like it's. Uh, it's kind of a trick. It's so like. I, uh, so what's the musical equivalent of this? Just to bring bring that back. Like I, that's how I feel when I hear a lot of just. If I go to a bar and I hear a blues yeah. band, like I. Why are you doing that? Are you only doing that just because blues is, you know, even if it's regurgitated a million times, if somebody's doing it in front of it in front of you and they're doing it with some feeling, then you can get into it. And even if there's not that much feeling, you kind of feel like, oh, now I'm in the blues mode. I'm, I'm, mm. I'm enjoying And they'll use the word, any, any, uh, any band or genre where they use the name of the genre many times is <laughs> something I'm always suspicious of. Wait, what about funk, funk it up? Funk it up. <laughs> We're going to rock you. <laughs> and actually sing about you. Like that's, that seems almost the same thing. Like, I'm playing power chords and I'm saying the word rock, and that'll make you think of rock and how much you like the rock that's better than the rock that I'm singing right now. You know, jazz has never yeah. really been guilty, ah. though. Nobody's yeah. ever said we're going to ah. jazz you. Right? <laughs> jazz. Oh. Yeah. oh, we're going to jazz you now. Manhattan transfer. <laughs> there, there's some very tacky kinds of jazz that... Uh, that's... <laughs> Probably do that. Yes. <laughs> the whole audience is getting really jazzed by this jazz. <laughs> and I guess I guess if you have like a beat poet fronting you, jazz band or something, maybe. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You never hear a, a jazz musician. Can you feel the jazz? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but that even uh, yeah, but that's I feel like it's it's even hard to. I don't think that happens. Well, okay, it happens in blues, and then, but that's so rock. You know what I mean? Is calling attention to the, the, the actual experience. It's no, but like, the blues. You know, we're singing the blues. That's why yeah, I'm singing the, the blues. Point. And there's so many blues songs. Like Mark yeah. was saying, they also point out, by the way, this is sad. This is the blues. <laughs> so since we're getting back to the genre stuff, which was one of the concerns on the discussion about authenticity, I want to hear more from Chris because Chris. So you were actually responsible, I, or at least chiefly responsible for those gypsy instrumentals, right? For the early yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and they were known as a genre band of a you know a punk band that's playing gypsy kind of. music. And, huh. and you know a lot of the a lot of the attempts, you know, in those early recordings were um, we were you know, the whole the term genre bending is just is just bandied about. To death these days, but yeah. uh, um, it was it was a conscious thing on our part. It, you know, on that first album, we were doing um, you know sort of countrified acoustic versions of Circle Jerk songs, and um, and then doing punked out versions of country songs, and then uh, you know and so on. And so we were you know that it was not as it was not as common you know in in 1985 and before, but. Um, and then, and then I was thinking about, yeah, I was thinking about, uh, I was listening to a lot of medieval music and thinking about, you know, fiddle stuff and, you know, um, and so those were the tunes that were floating around in my head and, uh, and actually David was coming up with a lot of similar things too and the, sort of the, the band that, the, the, the proto camper band, which was, uh, which was known as Sitting Duck and, uh, I thought, I thought Box of Laughs, I thought I was well, up on Box like... of Laughs... Box of Laughs was a different trip altogether, um, and you know it's funny too because there was a moment there where we thought um, you know, Box of Laughs was getting a lot, and we thought that that was going to be the, the band that you know that was that would tour and make records and stuff, and um, that it was it, it, it was one of, it was one of those personality things where things everyone was so scattered, no one could, could get it together to stay organized enough to uh, to pull a lot of that stuff off, but. Um, but the, yeah, the, the the project with those early camper records was very consciously to bring in these influences that were not rock, and um, and and mess with them and, and apply them in 
just um, sort of slightly you know, punk rock was really you know that that first wave of it was already kind of done, it was pretty much done by the mid '80s, and so we were we felt free to spoof that too, and so a lot of it was there was a lot of humor behind those intentions I think, and and also but also seriously musical like we wanted to play those melodies and make them sound good, and we were. We're practicing our instruments and trying to get better on them, and, um, and so we were keeping. In order to kind of, put, it was a combination of applying those influences and trying to bring them together, but also we we're keeping the song short, you know, keeping um, you know, keeping things kind of sort of, sort of the punk ethos about like short songs, you know, like get in, do it, get out, kind of. You might say, and so we were, all those things were coming together in that moment, um, and and bringing the other, bringing these other these sort of folk, uh, like East European folk fiddle influences, were just another. Uh, it was another curveball that we enjoyed. Driving. So it seemed like on the discussion, uh, Jonathan at least seemed a little appalled in retrospect that. You know that you were doing the what he called the uncanny valley thing. That that the the approach to, you know, just being eclectic, just being genre hopping. That there was something shallow about that. That they both had some contempt for now. Or I, I wasn't exactly sure with that. Uh, I mean, do you do you sh was I misreading that, or do you I, share any of that uh, disdain for your younger self? I don't know. Or, I, <laughs> but I think it's great. I, I, like I, don't, I still use because it. I, I. Yeah, I mean, I don't because I was having fun with it. And so I didn't have those, you know. Again, I never had concerns about being. I have. I never had concerns about authenticity. Um, it was. It was fun to, to me, to to mash all that stuff up, um, and, you know, and it works. It, it works for audiences. Um, you know, I don't know if I would. You know, so actually, I am working on. You know, I'm working on some new. Music for grown-ups um, right now, after, you know, after a long time of uh, not working on it, like a solo record project, but um, it's I'm just train of thought just totally derailed. Um, no, I, I, oh, sorry. I, I totally agree with that, though. I mean, if you're having fun doing it, why should you worry if somebody might think it's inauthentic? I mean, who right. gets hurt mm. if you're mildly inauthentic? Well, and again, in that, I think... There's a, there's an historical moment there. I think it, where we were at the time we were there, it um, you know there it was kind of like making like making weird puns. Like there was it, it would uh, um, it, it was a moment where it was probably more uh, more effective to do that because it, there wasn't a lot of that going on um, not so much, and so. It, and I think that's part of the reason Camper, you know, Frank, honestly, I, I do talk to people who, who still think the first album, you know, the first album is their favorite because of, so sort of, there's a, a whimsical quality to it that people, mm. that people respond to. And I think that was, um, I honestly think that was a big part of why Camper took off because there was, there was this element of playfulness about it that, in the midst of all the, you know, sort of the punk rock hardcore uh, thrash and stuff, I think people responded to that. I think people responded to the sort of tongue in cheek. Taking, we're very serious about not taking ourselves seriously, which can also get out of hand. And I think, <laughs> I think it kind of did later on, but in the, you know, in those early moments, I think I think the audience was responding. To it. So it's, you're kind of responding to to Danny's. Question earlier about the the parody songs. How can you have parody songs if you don't have a centralized culture that everybody knows the stuff? Mm. You can do parodies off of stuff that is just style. You know, people recognize style. this is this mm -hmm. is a, a right. Eastern European. I don't really right. know any Eastern European pop songs, but I still recognize a spoof of an Eastern European pop song when and I hear one. We, you know, it's funny how these right. songs became and like. Work, and we work. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Chris. Oh, oh, so, you know, we weren't, you know, quoting specific tunes for the most part, um, but it was, yeah, it was, it was stuff, and and people do recognize things on that level, you know. So, um, 
you can not be familiar with a lot of that music, but it's it's snuck in. You know, it's you know, it's in the air enough that you identify that you, know, you identify these books on the fiddle with a particular culture, and you know, we have enough we have enough uh, uh, cultural enough semiotic kind of baggage, if you will, to, to put that together. And so that was enough for us. Yeah, and I would argue. Um, I think, in a lot of ways, combining genres, um, especially if they're genres that influence you or um, genres that that you just really like, um, finding a synthesis for those is very authentic. Um, a lot of my favorite bands are notorious for that. Just combining different elements that you wouldn't think would go together, but um, you know, you're kind of taking things that already exist but shaping it into something new. Right. Um, and I think a lot of what we've talked about, it seems like there might be a confusion between originality and authenticity. Um, where I would argue it's probably much harder to be original, but um, it's almost like saying saying that someone's not authentic, it's, it would be kind of hard to, hard to judge that. It's saying like someone doesn't really believe in something. Um, uh, so really, you can only be the arbiter of your own authenticity, and hopefully, if it if it's genuine, other people will see that. But uh. and, and having said all that stuff, it's you know whenever I see you know band bios or ad, you know ad copy that talks about bands and and, and they use the term genre bending, it's like you know, yawn. I, I mean, who doesn't? Everybody, everybody right. is <laughs> taking influences from someplace else, and. You know, and so, let's you know. Okay, let's let's hear let's hear what you've got. Um, you know, John Mending doesn't, doesn't as such doesn't mean much. Mm. Everybody's, everybody's doing it necessarily. Genre bending and gender bending have, are so <laughs> close. I wonder if there's gender genre bending. I have a note when I listen hey. to the to the, uh, to the episode <laughs> of uh, <laughs> gender genre. I have a note that's, from. That's what uh, I do. Yeah. yeah right <laughs> Here, here's another yeah. random note I have um, from when I listen to the episode. Some of my notes, Mark, are, are good for uh, intellectual discussion, and some of them are just uh, not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Either one. Either one. Fine. <laughs> Uncanny Valley sounds like a great name for a dairy company. There you go. That's <laughs> 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 it. I actually just wrote a song called Uncanny, which is on my mind the whole time I was listening. So, yeah. <laughs> we have the freshest cheese here in Uncanny Valley. It's uncanny <laughs> how fresh our milk products are. <laughs> it creeps you out in a psychologically inconsistent way. <laughs> well, this might be a, a good place to bring him. Uh, so one of the... the we sort of talked about lyrics a little on the uh, on the episode, mm. and uh, both lyrically and as as Chris was just talking about in the style of the music itself, how humor gets incorporated or irony that that seems to add a wrinkle in the whole authenticity thing. That yeah. you know purposefully, you know just the, just the idea of oh, is my joke telling authentic or not like seems a little strange. Uh, the way you just described it, Danny, like, well, I'm telling, you know, observations about my day, and, you know, so I can make sense of it like that, but in terms of, uh, you know, funny lyrics for songs, uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, there are a couple of ways to do it. I mean, you could you could, you could could uh, do it sort of like you're talking about with the joke telling, that you're just expressing personal stuff that's going on, but you're expressing it in a witty way. So you're, you know, that sort of adds... Adding the 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 non sequiturs or the funny images or metaphors or whatever is another way of of uh, spicing up something. Uh, another thing that I really like in in music is when, like, you've got really happy music, but the lyrics are as depressing as shit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and that actually that use that Just humor, describe but, country music. <laughs> <laughs> that's often funny, but it also reflects my actual experience of, mm. of you know, when I'm miserable, like, this just mm. sucks, you know, just kind of having that, you know, that, that, that com emotional complexity is actually authentically part of the experience. Um, sure. On the other hand, one of the great things about using humor in music is that it doesn't even 
have to necessarily be funny. If you're just saying it to people, if you're te if you get up on stage and are telling jokes, like unless you're a really established, you know, monologist and and people will listen to you whether you're being funny that moment or not. But sort of the the baseline expectation is that you're you're being funny, you're telling jokes from moment to moment. But if you take like they might be giants, you know, known known or or Camper Van Beethoven, known uh, for in, incorporating funny stuff into their lyrics. But you know, I know with They Might Be Giants in particular, they didn't, they didn't want to label themselves a parody songs or not parody song. They just part of the part of the innovation there was to not label it was, was to self consciously like, are we being really artsy? Are we being silly? Are we, eh, just you know, write a song about the purple toupee or whatever. And uh, yeah. and there's something that distinguishes that from from uh, uh, Weird Al or you know, that's being self consciously. Yeah, it's ironic. like the difference between yeah. like. Frank Zappa and, and uh, yeah. Weird Al almost. I, yeah. I, yeah. I, Frank Zappa, yeah, definitely the guy, one of the guys that started that. Yeah, movie. excellent yeah. point of reference. And he has um, an album I think does humor belong in music. It's <laughs> the name of one of his compilations. There's a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, any, any, any thoughts on the general topic? Mm, uh, Zappa is, I think, a really good pivotal figure for a number of reasons. Um, I think a lot of times when we're talking about authenticity, this is going to be a bit rough, but we're talking about a vaguely kind of modernist idea of reflecting the truth. Um, and it, it could be an individual truth, it could be a social truth, but it's, you know, being there with the truth. Um, Zappa consistently is, and, you know, a lot represents for a lot of uh, composers and a lot of like art historians or whatever uh, the, the you know a real paradigm of post -mo post modernity which he's mashing up doo wop with you know stupid terrible lyrics with like Stravinsky which is you know it's, it's supposed to this collapse of the high and the low and this mashing of serious thoughts and you know shit eating grin irony um, that's supposed to that you know, by the time you end, uh, when I end like an early Zappa record, when he still has these elements together, because later on in his career he kind of separates the serious music uh, in a way fr from like the jokey kind of schlocky stuff. But I like the early Zappa when it's all mashed together. Um, this I think this weighs in the mind of a lot of songwriters that if they try to be serious and confessional and you know speak directly to the audience. A lot, of, a lot of audience members are going to just roll their eyes. Um, be like, eh, you know, I've heard this sincere appeal before. This is like, you know, someone handing out, like, I don't know, it's, you're, you know, you can't fool me. I know what you're trying to do. I'm just picturing an audience member standing up and saying, I've heard this sincere appeal before. I do not approve yeah. of your performance. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, another, you know, oh, you want to kill yourself. Yawn, you know, like, it's, it's like, no matter how intense... It is, no, no matter how human the experience is, no matter how hard you try to articulate it. You know, people are just not there for it. In fact, they're probably there to escape their own deep feelings in some way. Um, whereas uh, irony, or at least this post-irony, where you're kind of mashing up sincerity and, and you know, things that you directly don't mean, um, it allows, it's kind of uh, semiotically thick. You can interpret it in a number of ways. Um, people, like... I can listen to Zappa with like a libertarian who agrees with Zappa and a communist who hates Zappa's politics, and they can both sit there and laugh together. Um, you, you know what I'm saying. On another note, a hundred years from now, Weird Al's music is going to be considered serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, no, I, I think I doubt a, it. Yeah, I, I think a good modern it. example of that, um, at least for my taste, is uh, Father John Misty. I don't know if any, anyone else here has heard any of his work, but he came from more of a uh, singer, songwriter, folk, troubadour kind of background and um, basically tried to reinvent himself with this persona of doing exactly that, trying to figure in um, a lot of humor and irony and absurdity. Mm. To, um, but that is the shtick. Like, it's, you can take it serious, but it's also a joke and... Mm -hmm. um, so like, like the Folkman, like like Spinal Tap, is that what you're... Yeah. Kind of like that, yeah. If, um, like he had a great performance on Letterman, I think it was earlier this year, where it was real serious. He had a whole string quartet playing in the background, and 
he's sitting at this grand piano and just being real serious. And the song is called Bored in the USA, and it's basically a social satire on American culture. But um, And then you find out that the piano is playing itself, and then he starts, like, rolling around on the piano. And, but the words are really satirical and really... Um, they have a really good punch, but he doesn't take it too serious. And mm. um, yeah, I think there's there's a huge appeal, at least for me, for that. Uh, it gives you a lot of layers to dig through. So, well, I want to hear Mike address this because I think the reason that Mike and I did not actually play in a band together, at least for more than one gig in college, was that he he didn't like my cheesy ballads. <laughs> All your stuff was, was, uh, was had the had the humor element going on. But, you're muted, Mike. Yeah, okay, and now I'm unmuted. Um, I, I've found, like, I, there's only so much humor in music that I can actually tolerate. Mm. You can only use small doses. Like, I can't sit down and listen to a whole Day Mikey Giants album, right, oh. beginning to end. Or, I don't know, it, I just find it, it, it wears out its welcome a lot more quickly than sincerity actually does, or even just mm. obnoxious or something like that. Where trying to be clever is something that... I've, to me, just wears out its welcome more and more as I get older. It's like, mm. you know, you you've heard clever things before. You know, it was it was clever when you were 15 or 16 and listening to Thing Might Be Giants. It's, it's less clever now. And um, I, I mean, I don't mean to shit all over the whole like humor and music thing, but it can be overdone. And yeah. uh, after a while, uh, it just gets to be too much. Which sounds especially ironic. Coming from you, given that I recall your what turkey leg song or whatever. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I couldn't listen to more than two or three of my own things right now. So, yes, I mean I'm not excluding myself from this, this whole mess. Adrian, any comments on humor in the classical music world? Those wacky violinists. The only one I know of is PDQ Bach, and yes, that's. Very funny the first time you listen to it, and then it's just really weird if you listen to it more than that. <laughs> so that's a lot I have to say about that. Well, that. So that does bring up my problem with some of the Zappa stuff is that it, mm. it's too much of a performance, a one-time. You know, it's like it's like a stand-up routine. That most mm -hmm. most stand-up routines you hear once, and then you laugh at the jokes, and then you don't really yeah. want to hear that again. Like there are certain ones that are that are maybe mm -hmm. ritualistic. If you're hearing George Carlin do the seven dirty words or whatever, it's okay yeah. to know the routine in advance. Or, you know, I'm sure there are there are plenty of things like that. But uh, so if the humor is something that relies uh, relies on surprise, mm. then it's not, of course, going to work in a medium that's meant to be listened to over and over and over again. And that's mm -hmm. that's at least personally a fundamental way that I take pop music. That I don't even mm. get, you know, I don't even hear lyrics the first time. I know I already said this on the episode. Uh, uh, that I have to hear the thing over and over and over again. So if humor is going to be involved, it has to be, you know, I actually think for the most part, they might be giants, especially their more recent stuff, uh, is subtle enough about it that I don't mind hearing it over and over and over again in the way that I would not want to hear a Weird Al song over and over and over again. Uh, or maybe even if I did want to hear the Weird Al song, it, it would be because of the music aspect of it. It would right. sort of be in spite mm. of the lyrics. I ignore the lyrics mm. if I if I like it that much. Although mm. then I would probably just go back and listen to the original thing that he's satirizing. So <laughs> <laughs> I guess that also speaks to the the issue of you know what what I have against live performance. I know that it's it's really it's my own yeah. personal peccadillo that uh, I feel more comfortable. I'm just a homebody, and so I'd rather be able to create my product like a movie director or a composer and put it all together and get it out there. Uh, that, you know, I've had some very energetic, fun performing experiences, but I've never like done it every day for uh, for months in the way that, uh, <laughs> that uh, Chris, I'm sure, did yeah. in, in that stretch. Um, sure. Uh, but, but yeah, it, se it seems that if you were doing something yeah, you know, like it seems like it would be much. I, I know some people, like whenever there's a band that the guitarist is too good in it or whatever, it ends up leaving. I remember the the guy, when a jazz when a jazz player ventures into rock, and they'll they'll say like, oh, I couldn't stay in that band for more than a year. I couldn't stand playing those same damn songs again and again. Uh, I mean, do you get that? Like, I, I 
certainly I would just have enough songs in my repertoire that I that I would not get bored that way. Hopefully, uh, mm. and, and comparing that with the experience of a, 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 a touring comedian, I can't even imagine what it would be. You know, I I guess I see the the, the joy in sort of homing, honing your timing and mm. your craft and developing stuff. And anyway, any comments on any of that? <laughs> yes, I mean, I'm just saying yes. You're right. It's all about honing, honing the timing and and uh, hitting the beats and seeing if there's a more succinct way to get to your punchline or uh, playing with the wording language. That's where the artistry comes in when you're doing yeah. something like that. And, and and there are there are certain aspects of that that only repetition can give you. Mm -hmm. You can only you can only do that you can only do that kind of work. Like even rehearsing and practicing some experiences, trying things in front of audiences, and you know, and confronting that, and um, and plus, you know, interacting with an audience. Audiences are always different. You know, situation performing situations are always different. So that gives you something. You know, and if that's if if you you, know, you need to enjoy that in the first place. You need to get something you need to want to do, and lots of people do, and very many people don't. Um, and so that's fine. So it's, I don't know, they're two different, they're two really, performing and recording are two really different processes. Mm -hmm. Even if you're working on, even if it's ostensibly the same music. I enjoy them both. So, uh, so I, and, I, and I kind of keep them separate to some degree in my mind. You know, as, as being, I guess, yeah, I just, I feel like that when you're doing something, you have to feel like there's a reason for this new thing that you're adding to the world to exist. So it could just be mm -hmm. that I've never been in front of this particular audience before. They have not seen this particular performance, this message that I'm putting out. And so I can do the same exact show. You know, like if you're putting on a musical or something, uh, you know, maybe it's your ninth week, your your 26th week, if it's a very successful Broadway show, <laughs> and you're doing the same freaking thing, uh, but it still might be, you know, very satisfying that you're still creating this energy and you're putting it out to a new group of people. And and again, even music is is the kind of thing that you can repeat anyway. It's ritualistic, and so you still might get just as much joy. Uh, you know, I know that when when I've done the same songs, I remember my wife making fun of me for like in rehearsal, often singing melodies to songs that I've been doing a few years. And just completely, like, the melody is almost unrecognizable because I just, like, would get too bored with myself and just sort of start mixing it up. Like, and I would imagine even with the, I don't know, take the skinheads bowling, the lyrics sound, they sound like they were made up on the spot. Is that is that one that he would he would change it from performance to performance of what exactly was in the third verse? No, oh, no. Oh, no. Never. That's okay. cool. I mean, there were little oh, wow. variations, but that was skinhead. Yeah, I guess. Take the skinheads bowling was... I mean, we dared not change it too much. I mean, well, before that, it got that popular, brings up the other thing. Like, even as a listener, repetition can be important. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. And actually, I, I, live perform the few live performances I've been doing recently. Um, we've been doing recently. We've, we've covered Skinheads and done this really slow, sort of twee acoustic version of it, and it's actually really it's fun to sing again that way. Um, but it's. Um, Oh, so um, you know, even as a listener, I mean, you were talking uh, earlier about how you listen to something and you want to hear. You focus on maybe the instruments. You focus on the overall sound of the song for several listens before you start paying attention to the words. And um, and again, like repetition. And part of this is I'm coming from a, from working with young children, and where repetition is absolutely crucial to. Um, to learning and development, and you know, the kids want to hear and experience things over and over again because their understanding changes with every iteration of the experience. And so, and that's not, it's still true as adults. I mean, we, you know, we listen to saying, you know, how many times have you had an album that you just obsess over or a song that you want to hear over and over again? Um, and it's part of it's, it can't all be about. Getting something new out of it, although that's it's it's certainly possible to do, and there's there's a certain amount of truth to that. But also, you just want to hear it again, you just want to have that experience again. And so, um, if you're 
you know, you do get tired of doing stuff too much, um, and you do need to change it up. But there's something about just our experience of music um, that that is satisfied with, with repetition. Uh, I think, which is you know, and that, and that applies on the level of a piece or a song, and also on the level of a type of music. You know, like we know all the, you know, if you're a blues fanatic, you know all the tropes, you know the tropes, you can sing them, um, you've got them in your head, but you want to hear, you want to hear different artists you know, play it their way. Um, that's just, that's part of, it's, it's part of how we experience music. The repetition has a value in and of itself. No, I was just, I think I was just exemplifying the very thing I was criticizing earlier about uh, artists being too focused on the artist's perspective. <laughs> the fact that I'm bored of it as an artist, you know, that, that when Bob Dylan, if you ever see him live, like, plays unrecognizable versions of his songs because he right. cannot play those freaking songs from 1965 the same way. And right. it keeps, audiences don't actually like that that much. They'd really, they kind of like to know <laughs> what song it is that you're playing right. before you get two minutes into right. it, if this is yeah. one of their old favorites. Uh, so it's a little self-indulgent on his part. I, I still... Uh, Some I of them were unrecognizable in the 60s, too. <laughs> <laughs> I was at a show in Athens a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, it was after the encore, and so the, the singer came back out without the band, and uh, the crowd was pretty anxious, and he was like, I'm going to try and play some old songs, but you guys can't sing, because I don't remember how the original melody went, and you'll throw me off. <laughs> so he was basically had, the, uh, had to have them sing very quietly to these songs that the people knew every word and melody to, but uh, that was funny. Uh, but I think there is a... A threshold in in terms of um, I guess the creator and then the audience. Um, I know for me, when in high school and college, when I was playing in a lot of rock bands, uh, we would play around town at all the local bars and music venues, and uh, toured a tiny bit, and you know, locally. And uh, but it does get to a point if. At least for me, for us, it was got to the point where if you're not playing to a, a larger, um, a growing audience. I think it'd be a different thing if if it's a semi well known band. They're just I have friends that tour and do music for a living, and that's all they do is just tour, you know, here and other countries and just nonstop. And so they grow a base over. But I never had the the patience for that. So um, so for me, it just wasn't really worth it to play the same venues every few months and. Um, yeah, I'd rather just sit in my room and, and record stuff. Um, but, um, or even Don't playing... Don't people do that just because the idea of a day job is so <laughs> awful and that, you know, this, mm. do, do, even even under even touring around and playing and having to be in hotels and all the kind of downside of the touring life is still better than uh, <laughs> the day jobs they think are available to them. What 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 are you doing right now? What is it? Can, I, can we ask you? Me personally? Yes. What's oh, um, yeah, I do um, IT work. So I'm an IT coordinator for a, a health care company. Um, and I've been doing that for about the past eight years. But that was a, there was a point where I thought what I wanted to do was just create music and, and try to get it out there to people and tour um, until I realized how much work would go into it, <laughs> um, especially now with some friends that I have that do that for a living and um, their job is way harder than mine would ever be, even though they don't have to do the, the regular nine to five, but, um, you know, drive into a different state or city every day, um, you know, your whole day is in preparation for a show, setting up all the business angles of it, um, with the venues and merch and management and finding somewhere to sleep, having your stuff stolen not making enough money to barely live off of. They still have to have, you know, part-time jobs when they're off tour. Um, but, um, but I, yeah, I really respect people that can do that. And um, even discussions I've had at some of those house shows with musicians who have been doing their thing since, you know, for 20, 30 years now. Um, these days, that's pretty much what you have to do is just tough it out. I know David Bazan, who I've seen a number of times at the house shows, 
he has to tour two thirds of the year, you know, just to make enough money, because um, there's just no record sales anymore. Or, just uh, to make enough money for the heroin required. Yeah. For the yeah. Uh, Chris, it seemed like you you so with your teaching and stuff, you sure. reached a nice point of equilibrium that you can do the music and yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm all uh, yeah. I mean, I was I was determined. Well, I'm not really prepared to do something not musical, but you know, I was like, determined to to make my way through music somehow. And teaching's been a good way to sustain that. Um, uh, they say it's, when you I teach, teach. I'm Pardon? sorry. I was going to say, one of the best ways to learn is to teach, they say, right? Yeah, uh, in, Indeed, yeah. It definitely keeps you in touch with kind of the first principles of what you're trying to do. And, um, and so... If you forget ta-ta-ti-ti-ta... Ta, ta, right, you, oh yeah. You got that down now. I, oh, I got it down. I got <laughs> that down. Um, but, I mean, there are definitely things about... Um, there, there are things about like, working... Making a, making my own music work for me more that I miss, and I'm kind of, kind of striving to do to go more in that direction these days. I think um, uh, you know what we've been talking about the last few minutes definitely begs a lot of you know, um, questions about you know the, the economics of music now, and you have. Um, you know, so much is available for free, and musicians don't get paid. While the companies that, that mediate all this stuff, um, there's a CEO and, and you know, 20 or 30 programmers are raking it in. That's uh, you know, I definitely share the um, anger that you know that Jonathan and Victor uh, talked about before. Um, I think it's really uh, I think it's these are really difficult times um, for people who work very hard to create uh, to create music, and um, there's there kind of more options, but you really have to be cagey about it. And if you're trying to do a band thing, um, yeah, it's it can be very very hard. Um, and I think a lot of it, there's a, there's a lot of like like the up, you see the upward you know that sucking sounds and you know, all the balls coming up you know towards people who already have it. Is and that's definitely a problem. It's, it's increasing, and it's um, and so it's tough. I mean, I've been able to I circumvented a lot of that stuff by doing doing the teaching thing and, and sustaining myself that way. Um, I would like to. I would like to. I'm working now actually to, to make more time to do my own work. Um, but yeah, I definitely feel fortunate. I feel like I've been able to strike a little bit balance. So, uh, some of my so last bands. I'm 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 too old now. It's hard to be, find people in their mid 40s or whatever who are still looking to be in bands. But right. speaking as a person 10 years ago, at least, uh, I played a lot uh, with a lot of former professionals. So there were uh -huh. a lot of people that you know got did the did the touring lifestyle, got burned out, and now are just have their day jobs. And so they'd be happy. They don't. Right. They don't need money from the music. They already have have got right. that taken care of. So they'll come and play, you know, with their professional quality chops. My shitty right. gigs that don't pay. Right. Them. Uh, right. So like I, I, I feel nice. like we're all kind of together in misery. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know, I could I could probably the only thing stopping me from getting a bassoon player to play on my next song is just that I haven't you know bothered to do the outreach to find a bassoon player. Right. It's not that I think that I would have to pay the bassoon player. You know, even just giving the bassoon player thirty bucks would be like, oh wow, that's a yeah. You know, I actually made money off of music today. <laughs> right, right. Unless it's you know one of those people that is still trying to be a professional musician and like just has to feel like, uh, yeah, if I'm gonna play a note, I better fucking get paid for it because this is what I have to do. <laughs> this is right. the only way I'm making my living. Right. Uh, and everybody else has given up. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and it was. Kind of with my thing, like with those kids' records, um, you know, I, I paid the musicians, and uh, you know, and I paid for I, that was kind of those two records. That was kind of the last time I was actually in probably recording studio. And I do everything on my Mac now, but uh, here at home. But um, 
you know, I paid, I I did hire drummers and bass players and, and so forth to do a lot of things that I wasn't doing myself. And I had this nice little synergy with my my teaching work in that, you know, the, the families that I was seeing, the kids I was seeing and their families, they were my audience. And so they were buying my records. And so at the, for a little while there, I didn't have to do much marketing. I had done it already. Um, kind of in the way that bands tour, I had my students. So, um, you know, and of course, that's that's a way to go. There are lots of artists who were, well, you know, Dan Zanes is kind of the most successful example. You know, he's, he, he had this, he was a, you know, he, had, he was in a band, you know, with College Radio Darlings in the 80s, and then he had kids, and he had to figure out something else, some other way to do things. And so doing music for kids ended up being a really good, uh, really good way for him to, to to, to keep on, and I've, on a smaller scale, I kind of I did the same thing. Um, and so, it certainly doesn't seem, you know, inauthentic for for yeah, doing no. something that's sort of uh, almost a utilitarian, you know, not the purpose that one would expect. You're saying, oh, I I gotta write songs. Well, I get up in the morning to write songs. Then right. sort of doing children's music sounds like it's sort of a sellout gig from that perspective, it's, but clearly that's not how Dan Zane's, you know, right. it's exactly in the pocket for him. Right, and it wasn't that for me either because I actually care about working with children and I, and I enjoy that work and, um, you know, I, I care about education and so, so it's on my mind a lot, so it's, so it ties in, ties in really well. Um, People at the gig that will pay attention, they won't yes. just be off smoking and talking they, to their friends. They will. <laughs> The and you know, making them not talk to them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the the hours are different, but you know, a lot of the same skills and same you know, a lot of the same licks I would invite. So, um, and I know, you know, you know, a lot of the people who who turn to do the music for kids, um, you know, kind of see see the same see the same guy in the same way. And it's like I don't have I don't have to go to smelly bars. I'm you know I'm doing. Um, Doing a lot of, making a lot of the same noise, same kinds of noise, only at a lower volume, so I'm actually, I can still hear at the end of the gig. Um, so, um, so it's another variation. I mean, you know, music is a huge thing. There are lots of ways. To, there are lots of ways to do it. Um, and the whole the whole band touring paradigm, um, you know, if that's if, if those are drawbacks for you, there are other ways to go about it. You know, if you want to. Yeah, so I know a lot of really good musicians too who have their day jobs and they keep playing. They're happy, so, so, so good on them. Since we're talking about They Might Be Giants before, I gotta say, so that's another band. You know, they did a bunch of children's albums that I, because I had kids that were that young at the time that those were coming out, I, I heard a lot of times. And I gotta say that they're, they're uh, some of their best stuff is their children's albums because it was sort of like. <laughs> The lyrics are not going to matter. The lyrics are about the freaking ABCs, okay? Just deal right. with that. But then right. just musically, right. they could just kind of do crazier, more interesting arrangements or just more, like, I don't have to worry sure. about yes. being original. You know, if you're trying to impress yourself right. as you an don't. adult and impress your adult audiences, then, you know, you don't go for just the happiest, most awesome thing you right. can think of. You kind of feel like you need right. to skew it to be cutting edge right. in some way. And the fact that when they were able to drop their defenses and do that is some of their best stuff. <laughs> yeah, there's a it's great uh, Port, Portlandia skit about that. Um, where there's this really uh, <laughs> children's musician, and it's it cracks me up every time. And so they want to start their own children's uh, band. Uh, and it's, <laughs> the, the music was absolutely fantastic. So um, right, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I have a, a good friend that. Um, Actually, one of the guys, he played bass on a few songs on my last record, but uh, he does the same thing. He uh, teaches uh, music for children, and uh, he loves it so much um, ever since he stopped doing more of the touring and constant gigging around and stuff. Uh, he much prefers that. Yeah, so, you know, there, there are different ways to start. That really like so. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, find your, you find your way, you know. Well, it's, it's, I think it sort of gets um, you don't you don't have the authenticity Olympics when you're um, 
<laughs> making music for children. Yeah, you are just exposing them to a kind of pure joy of music, uh, and you know whatever educational content you know, you're going to put in there. But you you just you know it's like it's more for enjoyment, and maybe on a certain level that's like uh, this is going to sound a little goofy, but you're not trying to represent anything authentic. You're just kind of going for you know something, and that's you know there's something true about that. There's a, like a there's a deep, there's a deeper truth that you know you're not going to be able to represent in terms of authenticity, but it is authentic. Well, I think when you see it, I know I like to play music for my uh, three-year-old niece, and you know when you see the reaction they can get for just an unfiltered, um, you know, unjaded representation of just experiencing music, um, mm. even if I'm just playing, you know. Yeah. Twinkle, twinkle, little star on my classical guitar or something, you know. But yeah. to them, it's, um, you know, it it really does. I think even in that sense, there's um, authenticity, if even if not from the creator, but definitely from from them receiving it. You can can you say. imagine snobby kids? <laughs> <laughs> twinkle, twinkle, little star was better the first time. I yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, and so yeah, and you know, and I look to that. I look to that experience a lot. I mean, I think those kinds of interactions that, to me, are examples of really art. You know, even among even among adults, I mean, that's our basic um, need for music. I mean, music is music is very very old. You know, it's it's almost a lot of a lot of thought nowadays. Um, the activity in our species is almost as old as language and as old. You know, it's like the, the first known bone flute that, that was dug up you know, predates the last go paintings by 20,000 years. So, you know, if that was, you know, if, if the oldest known bone flute is 40,000 years old, you know, how much, long, how much more time had to pass before that was there musical thought before someone said, Flutes, I, you know, I can get these sounds that I want in, in this bell, and I can get these sounds that I want. So, um, so I, I often, I, I ref, when people get you know spin out about um, ideas around, you know, just to spin out about you know, troubles about making music and the economics of it and so forth, you know, I go back to that, you know, that kind of experience, to experience with kids, because this is. You know, this is what we do. It's sharing music. This is this is something that's really really basic, and it can be complex. It can be simple, but it's something it's something that human beings do. And I know not just human beings. I think I think it's, I think it's a shared thing. A lot of creatures, a lot of a lot of creatures do things that can be considered music, um, whatever, irrespective of the active other purposes that it makes. Or music serves a lot of purposes in other beings too. So. Far far too many of my songs are aimed at and sung to my pets, and I don't think they appreciate it. I don't think they do. Like, you know, yeah, well, yeah. But I love I love like stories like um like uh, this is a, actually this is a, a camper story, and we stayed with the with this couple who were uh, or we we visited them. Um, they came, they were coming to a bunch of our shows, and, and they they lived they lived in the in Canada. They were, they were kind of chasing us around. Oh, it was. Uh, they were also. It was. We were opening for REM for a month. This was way back in all of '86, and um, they had a. Uh, they tell us the story. You know, they were just like avid, but constantly music listening, listening to music and videos, and had vast libraries of things. And they had a tortoise in their house that they kept as a pet. And the, of a course, um, you know, like rept reptiles. A tortoise, a tortoise. Okay, not a tortoise. And All right. you know, reptiles don't have rep, reptiles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of reptiles. You know, they're very sensitive to vibrations, but they don't. You know, they don't have ears the same way we do. So, but this tortoise, you know, when they played the music loud, this this tortoise would stick its neck out and rest its chin <laughs> when it heard certain sounds. And so. Aww. Yeah. So. And when he that, didn't like him, he put his head back in his shell. I was yeah, so, very you know, so what kind of you know, it, it begs all kinds of questions about about uh, you know, how basic these kinds of activities are. Um, I was going somewhere else with this, but I got to. 
I can feel your vibes in my shell, man. That's good. Yeah. No, so just so that's you know when I work with kids, it, it helps me kind of keep track of just the basic um, the basics about music of music making and and you know and what a, what a great thing it is. And it's I can kind of strip away some of the layers. You know, if I'm, if I'm bummed out about uh, about some of these other questions. Wrestle with as much as, as important as they are to wrestle with. It's, it's good to just you know, like this is just something that we do and something that we can share. I think what we learned from this is that if you want to know if a song is good or not, you play it for a tortoise. Well, for a tortoise, yeah. It's like, yeah. <laughs> they're all about the bass. Man. They're all about the bass. <laughs> it's the tortoise tuning system. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a tortoise here in my place. Yeah. yeah, right on. I, I didn't I try this. Yeah. yeah, I run the material by him and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what if your animals have different tastes? Like, I remember I had uh, two dogs, you know, when I was growing up. One of them was all about the bass, and when I would play some, like, reggae or something, he would go, like, sit and, like, sleep next to the subwoofer. Um, <laughs> and, you know... Whereas uh, I had another dog who was really into harmony, uh, and so one, one time I played, you know, Christmas morning, I got uh, Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys, and I played Pet Sounds, you know, and, you know, no pun intended. Uh, this this dog just <laughs> went up. Went, yeah, but, you know, I, I can't make this up. The, the dog, like, literally, <laughs> instead of just being a dog, went up to the, the computer that I was playing out of and just, like, was sitting in front of, directly in front of the computer, like his master's voice, you know, the... The you know the HMV diagram with the dog sitting in front of the gramophone, sitting in front of my MacBook Pro, just like staring into the computer, like <laughs> so. My dog said different taste in music. Brian <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Wilson fan. Yeah, yeah, the harmonies. Adrian Cho, any comments mm. about dog taste in opera? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, what? You know, Chris was saying about, um, or well, you know, everyone was uh, talking about the kids' music and and um, lyrics not having to really mean anything. Well, I feel like that's true of my experience of classical music, <laughs> in the sense like, right, Mozart Requiem is Requiem, right? Like the, all the text is Requiem um, for the most part, or and a lot of classical music is just non-representational. Um, and that's something that appeals to me really strongly. I don't know. Um, I don't. I, I don't want to say it's like a purely musical experience, but I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Say so. it. Say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's interesting musical. how that relates to the kids thing because how you get kids into classical music. It's not that they can just enjoy the pure musical experience. Like you got to say, oh, it's Vivaldi's The Four Seasons. Like, this is winter. <laughs> True. This is the one about the boat, and this is the one about the stormy sea, and right. you know. Well, and yeah, and I, I think I would, I think I'd back up a little bit on that. So I, it's not that it's not that lyrics don't matter, but I think it's it, you know they're capable of relating to things in a lot of in a, in a lot of different ways, in a lot of ways that's very much do matter. And I think there's a lot of connection between music sure. and language. Right. That's really important to kids. That's really important to kids. And one of the great ways to get them into relate, get them related to the music is through through story, and, and you know, which also I think I think harkens to something basic, you know, in, in everybody. You know, so that's that's where opera exists. You know, that's uh, like, um, you know, people you know, tell story. You know, that's why there are story songs. I always, it's, um, you know, all those things come together. I always thought, Chris, that one of the reasons the Beatles are still as popular as they are is because of the story that surrounds them. I think about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. That's Mm -hmm. okay. Music is never only sound. You know? No, no, no. I, yeah, I wasn't trying to say that it was. I agree. There's uh, lyric can be really, really powerful. Um, but yeah. But I agree, I Adrian, that, that <laughs> when you immerse yourself, you know, this is the thing that all the that Schopenhauer and the Kant and all the guys we were reading were, were right. on about that that you can really immerse yourself in a way that. It's just it's very different immersing yourself in a symphony right. that's only meant to be listened to once and is meant to be listened to in a live setting 
with these booming, these these right. irreplaceable. You can't capture the harmonics of a full orchestra you know, on a CD uh, you mm -hmm. know, unless you have a really good sound system. Uh, <laughs> no, certainly not out of your MacBook Pro. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, <coughs> you know, totally different. Uh, function and so different structure of music than, than uh, the pop song that you're meant to be able to carry around with you now. Right. Mike, maybe you could work out a way, Mike, for us to be able to capture it. I see the wheels turning. <laughs> well, they're going to keep turning for a very, very long time. Better wheels are turned than mine. <laughs> Mike, do you have some closing thoughts for us from you to start on our, the, our last part of our journey here? Uh, my closing thoughts is I'm just not going to worry about it. Actually, authenticity. It's um. Yeah. It, I, I I think if I I'm not the right kind of raw material to be inauthentic. I don't think. No, you know, you have to have something to work with to be tr a truly inauthentic manufactured product, and uh, that ain't me. So, and I think that's <laughs> true for the vast majority of people too. Like we're not about to be sucked up by the machine because the machine doesn't want most people, right? It's so um yeah, that I'm not gonna sweat. Me, babe. Oh, that yeah. me. <laughs> Wait, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I am not gonna sweat authenticity. Uh if somebody catches me being inauthentic, you can bust me, but uh uh yeah, that's, that's my takeaway from all this. Max, when you started talking about your dog uh going to the yeah. computer I, I just remember uh, the way you said it. I wanted to start laughing because you're like, in that moment, my dog stopped being a dog and he went up to the computer. Yeah. And I yeah. thought you were gonna say, and he started blogging about it. And uh, he, <laughs> he was like, this doesn't. Sound, this isn't as good as I hoped it was gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. went on some Beach Boy forums and he started saying it's inauthentic <laughs> and it's unoriginal. Yeah. 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 Talk about that that uh, newly recorded version of Smile I own, Brian Wilson, yeah. with no mm -hmm. with no Beach Boys on it besides him. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know, man. <laughs> Chase, any closing thoughts? Um, not necessarily. I I really enjoyed the episode. I thought a lot of good points were brought up, and uh, yeah, it's good to see uh, so many people in here too. It seems like a lot of us are on the similar wavelength here, so. I would say that counts as a closing thought. Go ahead. Hmm. Oh, sorry. I thought someone was about to volunteer another closing thought. Max, do you have any last things? Last things. Um, I was really impressed by Schopenhauer and how much of my, you know, kind of like teen angst, um, uh, trying to understand why I cared so much about music um, and this kind of... Uh, connection to humanism and the universal human experience, like how much that spoke to me. And I was also relieved to hear that uh, that lyric poetry was the lowest form of poetry um, <laughs> because I, I, I used to write all kinds of poetry and now I only write lyrics and I am suspicious of, of, of poetry for some reason and I almost feel like poetry itself by, without song is a bit obsolete and that's weird but um, there's, we'll there's have something. an episode on that in the future at some point. I'm yeah. sure we'll. <laughs> yeah. I, I share that because it has the same non-musical. And now, I'm yeah. doing the poetry reading, and oh, it's very hard to change that tone because there's nothing. There's no music underlying it to change the tone. You need to, to have your yeah. your little uh, boombox or your your your, yeah. your triggered samples to go during the uh, to make the fart noises or whatever during the yeah. poetry. <laughs> I can hear I can hear Mark already being like the question of today's episode is something like is poetry dead? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I I don't know. I just want to put out there that uh, I I don't know. I, I appreciate this sense that uh, uh, it's a deeper sense that we you know this this kind of humanist mode of 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 music that you know is a big part of you know enlightenment art. I feel like that there, there's something about that that has passed us by. It makes me sad as a humanist, but as a musician that's trying to make sense of my experience, that uh, that makes gives me some comfort. <laughs> and how about as a blogging dog? 
Uh, as a blogging dog, I can say with uh, with confidence that the 40th anniversary remastering of Pet Sounds, you know, completely different. You know, it's like, rough. It's, yeah, it's just it's too com too compressed, and you know, just it's not just give, give the same too much <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just take take away the compression, all the uh, all the authenticity comes flooding back. Yeah. So, uh, Adrian Ch Cho, any last thoughts? Um. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So mostly, um, agreeing with let's see, uh, with Mike about the authenticity thing. It's interesting to think about, but not something I'm terribly worried about, <laughs> so far as I'm concerned. You know, um. Just keep doing what I do, I guess. And um, yeah, playing those major scales, those traditional <laughs> tunes. Oh, you gotta go Singing with your tones. voice instead of a instead of a wah, <laughs> instead of a squat box like a, like a cutting edge musician would be. <laughs> instead of yeah. mounting a rake on your bass cord like Victor did at that show that I saw, and whack it on stuff and make that your performance. <laughs> As my closing thing, I will share an anecdote, which is that so in in composition school, I, I was I sort of I dabbled with majoring in composition in undergrad at, at Michigan, and uh, one of the performances I did, I think the, maybe the first one, was uh, I, I was also doing some continental philosophy in another class. So I, I did this piano thing. I couldn't play piano very well, but I you know would, would hit some chords and then read some. Some of Hegel's phenomenology out loud because it just sounds so confusing. Awesome. And then, and then the, the, the climax of the piece was I would just pull out a, a, like a hand puppet, like that was basically like a, 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 a kid's like bathtub thing, and have it stare at the audience, just stare at them in silence for a little while, and then have it slowly turn and bang its head on the piano while I then continue to read Hegel. <laughs> so, uh, that's, that's usually how I feel when I try to read Hegel. So. I love that's it. My, Same my, reaction. That's that's my highbrow sign. <laughs> wow. Um, see more of that. I guess I'll I'll give you my closing thought, uh, which was the um, you talked a little bit in the episode about the Buena Vista Social Club and how you theorized that it became popular just because how how it felt. And uh, well, I wanted to give you a little story about. Uh, the Buena Vista Social Club, the first time I saw them, um, I, I saw them at the Corn Exchange in Cambridge, England, and uh, it was uh, the original singer who has since passed away. Mark, you might know the name. Uh, it was quite old, but anyway, I was like, man, I love Cuban music, but uh, it turned out uh, I don't love all Cuban music. It just was, uh, it, it's a certain feeling when, which really resonated when I was listening to you guys talk about it, that they have that makes you kind of like, ah, I'm not articulating this thought well at all, but it really did, it does make you feel something in a way that I thought they were the perfect example to bring up uh, in the episode as, as a band that really makes you, the way the music feels. So why did you pick them? Well, that was Victor's example, so so I I oh, right, that's pulled right. that out. But I, yeah, it did resonate with me. Uh, no, but I think you're being uh, feeling inarticulate about it is entirely appropriate, and we <laughs> should, as all musical discussions end, admit that this this theorizing is all post hoc, mostly <laughs> bullshitty, and uh, yeah. just be in the moment, man. Be in the moment. I love it. All right, thanks everybody, that's and thank good, you, Mark. Man. Thanks yeah, for another great bye episode. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Cheers. much for Chris, Chris Mala. And yeah, you, uh, thanks for reaching uh, out. I will, on the blog post where I promote this, I will put links to everybody's band's music or whatever. So awesome. uh, if I don't already Thank have you. links, or email me the most current thing that you would want sure. to be represented. And, uh, or that you cool. just, want yeah. to, just want to tell them. Yeah. I guess yeah, what I was trying to say is I really like the Buena Vista Social Club. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> I think we can all do it. <laughs> all right, guys. All right, so bye, long. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.